So welcome everybody to this conversation with Sandy Bigtree and Professor Philip Arnold. Um, and as I'm sure you're aware, this is part of our series that we call Changing Our Minds, a collaborative exploration of wisdom and action that might help humanity move into a new era of mutual flourishing for all species on the earth. An era that we might call ecozoic in both geological and theological language. My name's Deborah Colvin. I'm part of the Earth Justice team at St. James's Church in Piccadilly and Changing Our Minds is a project of that team. The other members of the Changing Our Minds uh, team are Sarah Mark, who's an artist and placemaker and Diane Pachiti, who's a poet um, and they're on the call today as well. So before we begin proper, um, I'd like to just make an acknowledgement of the land that we're on here. So many people here today are in the British Isles. So we'd like to acknowledge the long history of this land we now call Britain and all of the beings within it. We know that humans have lived with this land for at least 35,000 years. And for much of this time, the land was acknowledged as sacred with ceremonies, songs, and ways of relating that made a living bond between land and people. We also acknowledge our colonial and colonizing heritage in this place and across the world. So again, welcome to our conversationalists. Let me tell you a little bit about them. Sandy Bigtree of the Bear Clan is a citizen of the Mohawk Nation. She's a founding board member of the Indigenous Values Initiative, which fosters collaborative educational work between the academic community and the Haudenosaunee people to promote the message of peace that was brought to Onondaga Lake thousands of years ago. Sandy is a multimedia performance artist, and in the 70s, for those of you who remember that era, the Sandy Big Tree Band was well known. Professor Philip Arnold is Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Religion at Syracuse University and a core faculty member of Native American and Indigenous Studies. He was the founding director of the Great Law of Peace Center, which repurposes the site that formerly celebrated the Jesuits coming to Onondaga Nation Territory. He's the president of the Indigenous Values Initiative, which educates the general public about the Indigenous values of the Haudenosaunee people. Welcome, Sandy and Philip. It's so great to have with you. Would you like to say a word about yourselves and your, or your land and where you're coming from? <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. Um, Yoen Haskano, uh, in the Onondaga language, that means thank you for being well. Um, and the Scano Center, so Scano or peace is part of that welcoming greeting that uh, people acknowledge one another with. Uh, and uh, we'll talk more about that uh, right now um, in the future. But but uh, in Syracuse, New York, we're in the heartland of the Haudenosaunee, um, which is a confederation of originally five and now six separate uh, indigenous nations. Um, and in the United, what's now known as the United States, there were all kinds of confederations uh, throughout uh, the Eastern Seaboard uh, and around the and around what's now the U.S. So, um, but the Haudenosaunee had a kind of unique place in the history of of world politics. That was one of the things that we like to talk about. And um, even though you might not know it it has had a positive effect on the UK and European nations uh, as well. But um, we'll, we, we'll get into that in more detail, but, but right now um, it's just enough to know that we're, we're, you know, we're happy to be here today with you. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I, I will clarify that you may be more familiar um, in referring to the Haudenosaunee as six nations, because that's what the British called us. The French called us Iroquois, but we call ourselves Haudenosaunee. And, and even though there were several confederacies around the northeast of the continent, the Haudenosaunee had great influence through this, these teachings of the great law of peace, all the way north to like Nova Scotia, down to like South Carolina and west towards the Mississippi. So, um, it, many embraced this um, notion of peace that was brought to our territory many, many thousands of years ago at Onondaga Lake. And this is the center Phil directed the repurposing of, so we could tell this story 
and share it with people. But we work very closely uh, with the Onondaga Nation. This is Onondaga Nation territory. And Onondaga is more, is the, um, well, equivalent to what the capital is, right? They're the capital of the Haudenosaunee. So we have um, a Loyani, which other people have referred to as chiefs, but the, we don't have a hierarchical system among yeah. <laughs> people, right? So the Loyani are have titles, they're, they're men of the good mind. So they all come here still to meet at their capital, which is Onondaga. Yeah. And on a personal note, um, Sandy and I, well, well, when I got my master's MA at the University of London Institute of Archaeology uh, <laughs> back in 1985, um, we we attended St. James Piccadilly <laughs> a couple of times. We did. And uh, it was referred to us as a very friendly and welcoming church, and um, we enjoyed our time there. So it's really gratifying to be back with you all. Um, we hope to be there in person next month and um, um, meet many of you personally. Right, yeah. and forward thinking yeah. in yeah. kind of activist church. I'm so, so I'm in, so sorry in, that the that the return invite took forty years. <laughs> <laughs> I know, well, I know. Yeah. Well, we Things visited happen. when we we visit uh, London. Yeah. We have yeah, to yeah, we're church. we're very excited. We're oh, looking forward yes. to you coming in May. So, mm -hmm. so then on that note, then maybe you could we could kick off by if you could tell us a bit more about the history and work of the Indigenous Values Initiative and the Great Law of Peace Centre. Um, and Sandy, we really would love to hear the story of the Great Peacemaker and a bit more about the importance of this to to American history and our own history, as you say. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, kind of come, jumping ahead here uh, in in some of these questions. So. Um, I'm in religious studies and uh, and and a scholar in in the history of religions. And one of the things that you learn immediately doing Native American Indigenous studies is the fraught history of religion among Indigenous peoples. Yeah. So um, so we uh, when we when we first were tapped to create the Great Law Peace Center. Um, we knew that it couldn't have it couldn't be accomplished uh, without the close involvement of the Onondaga Nation and the Haudenosaunee. So, so in order to do that, and in order to have those kind of conversations, we had to change our language a bit. So um, they're not they're not um, really happy about the history of religion in their territory, and this. Great Law Peace Center, the first iteration of it was called the French Fort, which mm -hmm. celebrated for the last 80 years or so the, the coming of the Jesuits and the Christianization of the Onondaga uh, in the 1650s, uh, 1656 to 1658. And so actually it was a facsimile of a French fort for many years, and it was celebrating that history, which was frankly just a lie, because the Onondaga, after realizing that they were up to no good, that they had in mind over overwhelming them with military might and taking their territory and taking Onondaga Lake, when they realized that, they required them to leave, and they left in the middle of the night. Of course, this does not appear in the Jesuit relations, you know, but it is in and encompassed in a wampum belt, or um, these are these are belts made of shell beads that the Haudenosaunee keep as a kind of oral record, uh, a ceremonial record of what happened in the past, and also their duties and responsibilities. So religion has had a, a very uh, difficult history in the United States, and we could go on and on about that, mm -hmm. but. So, but so we settled on a values approach. That is what we're trying to communicate in the repurposing of the French Fort was and turning it into the Great Law of Peace Center. We were focusing on communicating the um, ancient enduring values of the Haudenosaunee and how those values have impacted Western democracy and the women's movement, for example, and other things as well. So what came out of Onondaga Lake is 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 really transformative in so many ways, not just to the Haudenosaunee. So 
uh, so when we repurposed the, the, the Scano Center, we wanted to focus on those values initially and then get to the contact period much later on, right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so the Indigenous Values Initiative was set up to support the work of the Scano Great Law Peace Center. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for that. So this um, replica before Phil was talking about, um, it, it was built in 1933 and right in Onondaga Nation territory, right where the Great Law of Peace was brought to the Haudenosaunee. And, and it was frankly against the law for indigenous people to practice their traditions until 1978 with the arrival of the Religious Freedom Act. So we had to endure this fort that's at our sacred site, and it's celebrating the Christianization of the Onondaga and can't say anything about it. You know, it was built in 1933, this fort um, replica. And of course, that was when, you know, Hitler was assigned chancellor in Germany. And fascism, you may not all be aware over there, but it was mighty strong in this country. Mm. And um, we even had um, one of Hitler's, um, you know, military leaders come over here and establish the German-American Bund in Haudenosaunee territory in Buffalo, New York. And so and that was in 1936. Um, we had, after the fort went up in 1933 to, you know, all the radio stations broadcast this event they drew 33,000 people to the opening of this fort that celebrated the Onondaga just um, embracing Christianity and handing over 600 square miles of their land to the Jesuits. And it didn't happen because, as Phil said, they ran the Jesuits out of here in 18 months from their arrival. And mm -hmm. um, so there's been a lot of propaganda spread um, in, the, in our own territory right here. And, um, you know, coming in on this, oh, I guess I will also add, after the French fort went up, the next year they put up a Columbus statue in our city. Yeah. And, yeah. and under the Columbus's feet, there are four severed Indian heads looking in four directions. And the thing is, the Italian community here solicited um, a sculptor in Florence to create this statue, but then they ran out of money to be able to bring it back from uh, Florence. So Mussolini paid to have it shipped to yeah. Syracuse. And he also yeah. asked that it be enlarged and that yeah. the inscription Columbus discoverer of um, what, the world or something yeah. um, be in there. So it's a very contra controversial statue here particularly and where it stands is another story. But um, so it was not an easy task repurposing this site mm -hmm. into um, the Great Law of Peace Center. And mm -hmm. we had to um, press against um, the county who owns this building and against the um, historical association who managed the, the narrative. And then, you know, um, the city and in mm -hmm. the state with the way the lake had been mm. used and industrialized to the extent it became the second most chemically polluted lake in the world. Yeah, yeah. And um, so we're dealing with all these, um, you know, very intense yeah. environmental issues, political issues, the silencing of indigenous peoples and this yeah. wonderful message that needs to be shared with the world about the great law of peace. So could you, um, could you tell us that? Could you go back to those thousand yeah, years and, and tell and us? And I'll try. I'll go on to the story. Um, okay, thank you, thank so you. It, it has to start with our creation story because we had um Sky Woman who who lived in the Sky World and she uprooted this celestial tree out of curiosity, and um and she fell through the hole that it left, and she was um pregnant. And she, as she was falling, she was able to grasp seeds in her hands. And then she's falling through this um, great void of the sky. And she's coming towards earth. 
but it was all covered with water at the time. And so at the time, there was a, a turtle and muskrat and seabirds that would land on turtles back occasionally and then fly off. And they saw her coming. And so they held counsel and determined they needed to all work quickly, work together to save her so she, they could prepare a safe place for her to land. So the seabirds cradled her. They set her lightly on turtle's back. Um, they noticed she had seeds in her hand. So Muskrat decided he would dive to the bottom of the sea and get some mud and slap it on Turtle's back, which he said she could live on. And she could then plant her seeds. So what she, the very first act she did when she landed was one of gratitude. And she began to dance on the, the little slap of mud. And as she danced counterclockwise in gratitude, massaging the soil, the soil expanded until it completely covered Turtle. And this mm -hmm. is what becomes Turtle Island, what mm -hmm. indigenous people here refer to as Turtle Island. So the place was prepared for her by the natural world. That is our creation story. We, mm -hmm. we did not create the place ourselves. We did not choose we're going to do this or do that. And it was the natural world that, that reached mm -hmm. out to sustain mm -hmm. our lives. So um, in time, um, Sky Woman gives birth to a daughter. The daughter um, in time becomes impregnated with the, the spirit of the earth. And she gives birth to twins. And unfortunately, she dies in childbirth. So Sky Woman raises the twins. But they're the cross players. They're kind of antagonistic to one another. Um, through this game of lacrosse, where one might produce a rose, the other will put the thorns on the rose. And they kind of go about the earth creating these oppositional forces, using oppositional forces to create the world we know today. So um, so people, you know, multiply and, and they're living in gratitude. But the sense of being in gratitude takes a lot of responsibility and paying attention to the world around you. And they became lazy in this. And in time, they became less grateful and began to complain and bicker. And it caused dissension in the family. It would expand into the extended family. And then eventually um, within nations and territories. So um, this is our, our story. There was a time when we were at war with one another. And we had um, a fearful leader at the time who lived right here in Onondaga territory. And he his name was the Tata Dao. And he was a great sorcerer. And many people died at his, his decision making and um, control and domination of the people around him. So it was during this time, there was great bloodshed and sorrow. And there was um, a boy born just across the waters in Canada. And he had a vision from the creator that he needed to come over and show these people their way, their way back to peace. And now this is the peacemaker story. So this person, um, we call the peacemaker. We don't share his real name. Well, he came across the water in a white stone canoe and he came into our territory with this message. And the very first person he encountered was Jagonsa Se, it was a woman. And the reason he was drawn to her is because she had a she she wanted everyone to get along. He noticed her big heart and she'd prepare lodging for all the warriors fighting on both sides. And she'd try to get them to talk and telling their stories. She'd feed them, provide lodging, and then send them on their way. And the peacemaker told her, um, I have a better direction for you. And this is what you're going to need to do. And so through um, the instructions, she was to select 49 women and take them into the forest. And as they followed the protocol of the peacemaker, one by one, each woman would be approached by an animal or a bird or a, a sea animal. And that would become her clan. They were what they were doing was presenting to her her clan. So then mm -hmm. she would be in charge of um, from that point on to selecting the Loyani men because this was all going to be about establishing a good mind. 
So she would then select the Loyani that would be the um, partner to her of this particular clan. So 49 clans were established at that time. Those 49 titles were established, which represent the Loyani. These are all men of the good mind that work together under the instructions of the peacemaker. And that laid the groundwork for reestablishing that sacred connection between human beings in the natural world. Um, the next person the peacemaker encountered was Hiawatha, and he was kind of on the edge of a um, uh, lake and great sorrow and pain because he lost all his daughters to war. And he'd been known as a wonderful orator, and he was always preaching about peace, but to no effect. And so the peacemaker immediately went to him, and through the use of wampum shells, which is from the quahog um, shell found on the eastern seaboard, um, he fashioned beads, and he used these wampum strings to heal ritually the body of Hiawatha. And he cleared his eyes so he could see again. He cleared his ears so he could hear um, more, more honestly what was being said and cleared his throat so he could speak. And so Hiawatha was healed. So he and Gonsase accompanied the peacemaker and then they set to travel to all the other five nations at the time because they knew um, they would all have to come together of one mind before they could even begin to approach Tata Dao, who was that feared sorcerer, murdering and dominating everybody. So in time, that's what they actually did. And they traveled all over this region to pull all the new appointed Loyani together. And they were their clan mothers and all of them, they came to Onondaga at this sacred lake and they were able to um, clear the mind of, of the Tata Dao. And he had, at the time, snakes in his hair. So they say they combed the snakes from his hair. And at that moment, um, the peacemaker said to Tata Dao, because you have transformed the most of anyone, you will be the central figure of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. You will relinquish your clan because you will be neutral in speaking and representing all clans. So this was the beginning of this indigenous form of democracy where everyone would have voice and representation through their clanship with the natural world. Yeah. And today, this title, all these titles still hold today. And the mm -hmm. Tata Dao resides at Anandag, and we work with him, you know, and the other Loyani. And he always says, um, peace can only be obtained when you're in proper relationship with the natural world. Mm. Because that was the basic message that the peacemaker shared. Mm. It's in Scano, that's what Scano means. Yeah. So they have withheld those traditions through today. Mm. And Onondaga's form of governance is this clan representative democracy that existed before colonization. Mm. So we're in a very unique place because every other Indian territory, Native American territory in the Americas, fell subject to the United States public regime called through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which reinstated an elective system of domination that the U.S. oversees. They redefine this um international uh, treaty status of nation to nation agreements. Through time, they refer now to Indian tribes around the Americas as being under the guardianship of the United States. But here at Onondaga, they never accepted those definition, definitions. And they've made numerous attempts to the United Nation to uphold this, this original um, status as being sovereign unto themselves mm -hmm. and how those first treaties with England and, and the Haudenosaunee and, you know, the Dutch in the Haudenosaunee and the U.S. in the Haudenosaunee were meant to be. Yeah. So it's, it's just, there's it's a just, lot I just fed you. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> extraordinary that it all goes back to that, to those, those 49 um, yes, alliances yes. or, or right. relationship with, with creation. Yes. It's mm -hmm. incredible. Yeah, thank you. Can I? I mean, okay. 
much less positively. Can can perhaps for for people to um, hear more about the this this doctrine of Christian discovery, which which upended the whole thing. I mean, in order to understand what has happened, we 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 need to understand that, don't we? <laughs> yeah. So so um, so even though well, picking uh, you know raising up a few a few of the the elements that Sandy was just talking about. Um, so the Haudenosaunee, it's important to, to know that they're matrilineal. So the identity of all Haudenosaunee people is inherited through their mother. So the mother is the leader of clans, and they're the ones that select male Oyani chiefs uh, to be raised through condolence um, into their offices for life. Now, women can also take them out of office as well uh, if they're not uh, acting uh, on behalf of creation or on, on behalf of the clan. Mm -hmm. So that's real power, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and so what we're describing here is a kind of radical democratic system uh, that is governed by, essentially governed by women. Um, and, for, and, and something else too, that Onondaga is one of only three that are still governed by their pre-American system mm -hmm. and, and recognized by the UN, United States. Of the 575 Native American tribes or nations, um, only three are still governed with these mm -hmm. pre-American system. And Onondaga is one. Uh, it's the central and they're fire. All, all Haudenosaunee. Yeah. And they're all Hoodnish, all, all three, three of them are Haudenosaunee. Yeah. So so yeah. so people need to know that that they've hung on to this system in spite of the fact that that the doctrine of Christian discovery was really an, a, a, attempted in various ways to run over native people, uh, indigenous peoples all over the world. Now, um, essentially, uh, it, it grows out of 15th century papal bulls, Vatican documents that that um, essentially give Christians sanction when they enter the lands of non-Christian people to claim all of those lands, to enslave all of the people that are on those lands, and to take all of their worldly possessions. And this begins in about 1455, 1453, something like that, with a series of papal bulls. And then, of course, this is what's behind the age of discovery, Columbus, and all of that. Um, and this initially had to do with Portugal and then Spain, but then, um, you know, um, Britain got into the act with the 1494, 1494, um, uh, Cabot Charter, where Henry VII, um, uh, uh, gives the Cabot family license to essentially, um, uh, uh, conquer the entirety of North America. Uh, and then, of course, the French are into this as well. But but so church and these um, kingdoms are in in uh, alignment with one another to to take control of the rest of the world for the purposes of establishing Christendom or the kingdom of Christianity. Um, and um, and so that's why just last year you get the uh, repudiation that comes out of the Vatican of the doctrine of Christian discovery. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there have been a number of repudiations over them. They have different kinds of, um, they're, they're attempting different kinds of solutions. Some of them are more focused on saving Christianity in some ways. Some of them are apologies outright to uh, indigenous peoples whose whose lands have been stolen, or people in Africa who've been enslaved, you know these kinds of this. So it's make people are making genuine attempts now uh, to um, to uh, make amends for these past injustices in the doctrine of Christian discovery. But that's really only started since 2009, right? And those those repudiations are starting. But this is. This is really essentially the cause of trauma around the world, environmental devastation, because mm -hmm. we're talking about the origins of transatlantic 
trade, um, um, you know, the um, the development of um, the capitalist system of of uh, you know um, uh, of moving goods all around the world and that sort of thing. So 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 there are there are lots of repercussions of the doctrine of discovery. Now you'd think that this five hundred year old uh, crazy religion talk, which was essentially a continuation of the Crusades and other things in Europe, would be gone by now. But you're seeing the rise of Christian nationalism, for example, in the United States. And this is really kind of an, another iteration of uh, the doctrine of Christian discovery. I mean, you're seeing it in Europe, you're seeing it in Germany and other places. So there are a number of us in religious studies that are trying to uh, give clarity for the origins of this kind of religious orient orientation uh, in history so that we can deal with it in the present. Yeah. You talk about yeah. repudiation. What does it even mean? Yeah. Because so much damage has been done structurally to who we were in having this and maintaining this proper relationship with the natural world. When the colonists and, and Jesuits came over here, uh, they knew exactly what to target. And they called our women the firebrands of hell because they knew the, the central, how central they were to our identity and, and maintaining that identity. So the first thing they did was rename us. You know, mm -hmm. we're talking about clan mothers having so much influence. Each clan mother has, um, she's in charge of many, many names, which she distributes to her particular clan for each person. There's no surname, there's one name, it's that clan name. And mm -hmm. it identifies the child to the natural world. And they're the only person with that name until they pass. And then it's returned back to the metaphorical basket and mm -hmm. it's held down to for a year until the, the spirit can process through you know, their, their death. And then it's reassigned to another person. So that name is their identity. And, mm -hmm. and the natural world recognizes that child through the name because it's been handed down since creation. So when the Jesuits come in, the first thing they do is they reorganize the matriarchy. Or I, I don't even like using that name because it's hierarchical, but they they reformat the matrilineal line into a patriarchy. <laughs> and mm -hmm. they assign surnames and they make that nuclear family. So the male is the central figurehead. And then he has to, you know, answer to the local priest or minister who then represents, you know, God or the Pope, and then the higher, mm -hmm. you know, that whole hierarchical structure. Mm -hmm. And once you lose your name and, and, and through American history, those children, you know, often had their names changed once they were taken from their homes and put in boarding schools. Mm -hmm. So they had a whole culture stripped from them. They're given mm -hmm. these Christian names. They're beaten if they speak their own language. Yeah. And then they come out, you know, lost, totally lost. And then those are the people that the United States has groomed to become the new chiefs of these yep. Bureau of Indian Affair governments. Yep. And, and they maintain, you know, these demonized traditional people are not allowed to speak. So they represent their people, you know, under this new regime, not the traditional people. So we're still dealing with the effects of all of that because my grandpa was in boarding school. I had aunts and uncles who were in boarding schools. It's not all that far back, yes. you know, yeah. but a lot of this, you know, happened in Europe before they came here because they knew exactly how to destroy mm. our indigenous cultures. Mm. They mm. already did that in Europe, right? Yeah. So, yeah, we're looking at papal bulls, for example, the papal bull that was, what, 1159 yeah. or 11, yeah, uh, that was issued for the, for Britain to, to conquer Ireland, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, that this, these, these ideas go way back, you know, the mm. simple, the simple hegemony of of Christianity over and above all things, you know, mm. over and above all other religions or spiritual traditions. Mm. So, I mean, um, there's, there's a lot, a lot to, to learn from observing what yeah. we've gone through. I'll yeah. mention 
I'll mention also, so um, we had, uh, Sandy and I put together these 10 religious dimensions of the doctrine of Christian discovery, uh, which are on our website, uh, mm -hmm. doctrineofdiscovery.org. And essentially, these are fundamental tenets or what seem to be fundamental tenets of Christianity, but I'm not so sure about that. And then responses from mm. an indigenous values perspective, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things, for example, just the, the first one, is that Christianity is uh, the sole uh, proprietor of salvation of human yeah. beings right that it's over and above all other religious traditions well indigenous peoples however they do diversity very well <laughs> very well because just uh describing the confederacy a uh, hundred miles to the east or west of us there's a whole other language there's a whole other ceremonial tradition there are all kinds of other leaders so for thousands of years uh just the onondaga would have an ability to welcome others who speak different languages, perform, have different ceremonial traditions that are rooted in their own places, you know, their sacred places, and be able to engage in a kind of peaceful relationship, right? So, so indigenous peoples already know that they're not the only ones in the world, and they don't require everyone else to convert to whatever religion, if you like, that they're practicing. You know, it's not something that is hegemonic at all. It's the opposite of that. So that's just one example. But mm. we go through several others as well. Right. When you're related um, proper relationship to the natural world, the natural world is always changing. The waterways are always changing. There's nothing more diverse than the natural world. And our food was much more diverse before it was colonized into, you know, specific, like a potato. You can get maybe five different potatoes, or yeah. I grew up with even less than that, right. you know. Um, but but they're traditionally, actually, they're, they're there are hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of varieties of, varieties of just yeah. potatoes. Or hundreds of varieties of corn. I mean, yeah. uh, here at Onondaga, I think there's over 600 varieties of, of corn that mm. have been uh, that they actively try to to uh, to nurture here to grow, you know, so the seed can uh, keep uh, they can keep the seeds. And there are these there are different colors. There are different kind of mm -hmm. um, elements. They have different tastes. So, yeah, they so grow in different environments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a, let's talk about food, food for the future. I mean, so, uh, there's parallels in, in, in Australia where I think until very recently, um, settlers only, I think it was only macadamia nuts was the only really consumed food that had been there <laughs> among the many hundreds of thousands right. of, of types of food. And again, 300 languages across a continent. Um, exactly. And all of this is is way past paper bulls. It's it's repeating it all again after, after what happened in right. Turtle Island and many other places um yeah I'm just... and, and, and this and this well sorry i, I know we're no we're, carry on we're, it's no, all right. no, no i mean <laughs> so so this process of of six or originally five now six different nations coming together around the great law of peace and meeting regularly in what's called the grand council here at onondaga this impacted the founding fathers, what we call mm. the founding fathers in the United States. We're coming mm. up to the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, right? This, you know, momentous moment, uh, momentous time where, um, but come to find out, you know, that they, uh, all of the, Ben Franklin, all of these different, um, uh, you know, revered uh, white settlers of the past, really had a long and enduring relationship all through the 18th century with Haudenosaunee Loyani. Mm. They would meet them in 1744 or 1755, or they're all the, they're embedded in their notes of these Im, uh, important meetings forming the American democracy. And, and, um, uh, and, and, you know, one of the, one of the lessons from the peacemaker that was taught to the founding fathers is if you take one arrow, it's even easily broken. Uh, if you take an arrow from each 
separate nations, six arrows. And then you want, uh, bind those together with the sinew of the deer, the leader of the animals, the natural world, etc. And then uh, along with the values of the great law of peace, no one can break that bundle. Mm. And that, that image of uh, arrows clutched in the eagle's talon remains on our currency or in the presidential seal. If you try if you check it out, you know, you see, you know, President Biden behind him is an eagle with arrows in his talon. Well, that's a that's a teaching from the peacemaker directly mm -hmm. that happened here at Onondaga Lake. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Philadelphia might be seen as one of the origin spots of of American democracy, but really it's Onondaga Lake that carries that kind of those radical democratic principles of mm. um, of 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 democracy. The same is true with the women's movement. So mm. the women's movement is inspired in the 19th century, 1840s, 1830s. Uh, first women's rights convention was here in Seneca Falls in 1848. So this is discussed by. Um, Sally Rosh Wagner in a remarkable book called The History of Women's Suffrage. I can't see this. No, you can't see it, but it's a coin. So this was commemorated no, yeah. up here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the US yes, but we can get a, we can... the arrow going back to the founding of the Confederacy. Uh-huh. That's a that's a coin minted by the United, United States. States government in 2010. Um <laughs> that um that commemorates the, and it's been formally acknowledged of the Haudenosaunee influence on Western democracy. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say, you know, most people don't know that democracy came out of Onondaga Lake and not just Philadelphia or Washington, D.C. So, so that's one of the things that we're trying, but the women's movement. But mm -hmm. the democracy, the, the long house where they meet, that's divided into like two houses and you have the elder brothers um, seated on one side, which are the Seneca and the Mohawks, and then the younger brothers seated on the other side, which are the younger, um, the Oneida and Cayuga, and, and, and then added Tuscarora later. But they debate and, and discuss issues um, across a fire. And then mm -hmm. at the other end is Onondaga, and they kind of sit as the like Supreme Court, this other um, neutral kind of um, observation, yeah. and and so, and then Tadadao, and then Tadadao, which is kind of the central like president figure, but the Supreme Court came from this formation of the Haudenosaunee, huh. which was unique in the world having yeah. a Supreme Court. Well, it certainly, it's not was inspired. quite operate rating as it should be because it's gone over their heads. Yeah. Um, this notion of living in proper relationship. I should mention the first treaty with the Dutch in 1613. It was, um, uh, they were approached by the Haudenosaunee that they could live together side by side, one traveling down their river in their ship, one traveling down their river in the, our canoe, and never to interfere with one another as they share in the river of life. Mm -hmm. But the problem with how that played out is Europeans didn't understand what that means to share in the river of life because yeah. that is proper relationship. Yeah. So so um, from the work you do in the in the center and and the education and the collaboration how you know how can we live better in the west what are the steps we can take to to try and I mean if you think of our british parliament <laughs> it's very far removed from what you're describing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so same with the U.S. government. So, yeah. I mean, even though even though certain elements have been borrowed, I, I would I would include the Parliament as well. You know, so or the United Nations. I mean, the mm -hmm. the idea of liberty and freedom kind of swept through France, for example. I mean, the, these ideas, uh, you know, later in the 18th century, you know, um, resulted in you know uh, the French Re Revolution. So, mm -hmm. I think these ideas of liberty of, of uh, uh, representative government uh, have only been borrowed to a certain degree because, mm. you know, uh, after all, our economic system does not include the free and sustained 
view of other living beings in the world. No, exactly. The Haudenosaunee, the Haudenosaunee always, always include uh, the role of non or other than human beings, as Robin Kimmerer would say, right? Other than human beings are. And how, probably... how do you do that in a on a practical daily level? Yeah. So, so one of the things that one of the original instructions of the Haudenosaunee and one of the elements that we try to emphasize at the Scano Center is the what's called the Thanksgiving address. But mm. the the actual translation is words that come before all else. So the Haudenosaunee, anytime there is a meeting or uh, any kind of meeting or a gathering or a, an event, uh, it's even, uh, they, they recite the, this Thanksgiving address and it has 18 different segments, which is an address. It's not a prayer. It's not a petition to a deity or anything. It's, a, it's an acknowledgement that all these other, other than human uh, beings are really the basis of our lives and we give gratitude to all of those beings and if you look it up on the internet there's several different versions of the thanksgiving mm. address mm. um there's one through the smithsonian um uh, museum um american indian museum and and that's a pretty good one and it's based it's, it's a real kind of practical way of essentially bringing minds together as one so everything works on consensus among the Haudenosaunee. They have to come to some agreement. And, and so that means a lot of conversation. Things take a very long time to, to uh, decisions take a very long time to, to be satisfied. So, so it's through the great law of peace, through the, the, the Thanksgiving address that, um, that they're able to acknowledge together that we essentially have to be grateful for these living beings around us. And that's a day-to-day -day practice, right? That's a, um, we do it every day. You know, we do it every day to acknowledge uh, with gratitude these non-human persons. And, and it's essentially our economic system uh, is, is set up to service us. You know, anything... Uh, you know, um, all all of these non-human persons are only evaluated monetarily in terms of their use value for human yeah. beings, yeah. right? And it's just exactly opposite of what needs to happen. Yeah. So I think what we need to do is continue to be inspired by the Haudenosaunee, you know. This address can sometimes take hours when we're signing yes. a townhouse, literally yes. half yes. a day. And it's depending on the severity of the issue, because yeah. it's a process of bringing minds together as one. That's mm -hmm. how each repetition for each um, sacred being ends. And now our minds are one, but mm -hmm. they're including minds of that particular being mm -hmm. that they're addressing. And it's not a prayer. Um, it's an address, as, as Phil had said. And... Um, it's, it's very powerful. It's a way of changing the way you think about things. The mm. Haudenosaunee do not see themselves as stewards of the mm. land. Mm. It's quite the opposite. The land is a steward of us. It yeah. provides life and substance. substance yeah. and so yeah. it's um, quite, quite a different way. As one of the clan mothers Maybe. says at the yeah. Scano Center, uh, uh, we're not in charge of the world. I mean, as much as we might fantasize about thinking that we're in charge of the world, actually we're not. Mm. You know, mm. going back to that two-row wampum, living side by side, going down the river of life, soon after, well, when, when after the Revolutionary War, um, they were talking about the rivers of life, and what the colonists did was they built a, a, a canal um, that went right through the entire middle of New York State so they could transport goods from the Atlantic to the Great Lakes and move into the interior of this continent. And mm -hmm. so it's an artificial canal, which uh, Jake Edwards, when, one of our um, board members, Onondaga uh, speaker, he said it was, in fact, a dam. And it just like destroyed all the, the tributaries that went north and south of the river that was there. Mm. And it's a, mm. it, and it created such environmental havoc mm. 
throughout mm. the entire it's still um, there. Northeast. It's still <laughs> there. They're celebrating that next year. Yeah. And yeah. um, lots yeah. they're working with us and we want to. No, but they want sure. a critical assessment because, yeah. you know, so. all of us are concerned about what's the future. How do we yeah. assess from the past? what the best way forward is and that's goes to the goes to your question you know yeah like, yeah um how can we improve how can indigenous values one of the questions on the chat too how can we how can we um um understand better indigenous values so that there might be a more viable future because obviously this is not working for anyone yeah understand and then implement in some in, in some yeah, way right, i mean right. speaking to to some indigenous australians there's a there's a big focus on on what we might call bioregionalism so so living within your watershed to your point about the canal um yeah. i don't know whether the whether the haudenosaunee have have work around that but it seems like something that could be applicable anywhere in cities in in right. all over the world uh, yeah. and i think also too along with that with that goes with that is what are the rights of these uh, non-human persons, right? Yeah. What kind of legal status does a river have or a body yeah. of water? Uh, we we're in the Great Lakes region. We have we have to protect nearly twenty percent of the freshwater resources of in the world today, mm -hmm. um, and there are pipelines running underneath them and all kinds of things that people are worried about now. And mm -hmm. and. and, mm -hmm. and and is there a kind of, and I think this is also happening in Australia, New Zealand, that, you know, there is more of a legal status to these bodies of water because water <laughs> is life. It's just, it's a biological fact. It's not a, it's not a belief system, you know, it's like, yeah. it's the way it is. So, you know. Yeah. Colonists yeah. entered this continent and went from one end to the next, putting up dams. And most of them were put on Indian territories. Yeah. So it affected, you know, cut off the water supplies, fishing um, for all these native um, nations and, um, and and it affected, you know, the entire continent, and the ecosystem, mm -hmm. which you're seeing the effects of today. Mm -hmm. Right now, currently, the Onondaga Nation um, is, so beginning in 2005, they filed what they call the land rights action. It's mm -hmm. not a land claim but it's a land rights action in that they understood that the land is suffering in their territories and their territories have been reduced to a you know small patch of land just 5 miles south of here which is called the Onondaga Nation but but really it we're it's here in Syracuse we're on unceded land is there's no yeah. Yeah. there's no question legally that this land was stolen illegally and so you know so this this means that, um, um, but I mean they're advocating for the rights of the land, right? Mm. The light rights of Mother Earth, mm. rather yeah. than just a kind of claim to land, claim to property, but and because they want a say in how the land should be treated from now on. Given mm. as Sandy said, you know that Onondaga Lake is is still among uh, is like the second most polluted body of water, sacred place where uh, the great law of peace was founded that had this traumatic impact all over the world. And yet it is still, even though they claim to have cleaned it up, which was just really capping all the toxins mm. uh, and the mercury in the bottom, which has already failed at least twice. Um, so that, you know, so the um, so um, what will be the future of Onondaga Lake is one of the questions, right. because as one person put it, um, Onondaga Lake is our relative. Yes. Um, and yes. you don't give up on your relative just because they're sick. Yeah. You try to do everything you can to make them yeah. whole. But it sounds as though you're doing the medicine right on the on the on the edge of <laughs> yeah, the lake. Right, it's amazing. Right. It's amazing. Sorry, Sandy. Yes. So I saw a the question, text? could you elaborate on indigenous values? So that's pretty much what we're talking about. Yeah, right. yeah. And I'm talking about putting that canal through the state. Yeah. Uh, indigenous values would not have done that because the river I think, that was where the tributaries had their own um, yeah. and value. And this um, canal, the value of the canal was to transport goods. So we're talking about conflicting values here. 
monetary think, values and can I can I just think, just expand on that a little bit about you touched on it at the start Phil about about religion and values and and it and it doesn't yeah. work to refer to yeah and I think that's practices as that, religion um yeah. and yet but I, I'd be quite interested to hear about the the importance of ceremony and invocation and ritual and 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 that sort of part of praxis um, yeah. in relation to this religion and values yeah, I mean, um, well, one way to think about it, I mean, there's a lot of ways you could think about it, is that what we're not what we're talking about here is not really religion. It's not really a, a belief system per se. It's not a system of faith necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's a way of engaging and and addressing uh the world around us so that we can live in proper relationship with it. I mean, it's just as just as the Thanksgiving address is not a prayer, it's not a petition, it's not a request for more stuff or, you know, greater happiness or something like that. It's it's an acknowledgement that there are other than human beings that are involved in our lives, ancestors, for example, you know, or other spiritual beings that are that are involved in in who we are. So, mm. so it's not really a belief system. So it's almost like science, you know, in a way. I mean, it's yeah. almost like it's almost just practical knowledge and mm -hmm. so and so if they deliver these these addresses in their language they understand that the language can be heard more fully uh by the natural world because that is the language that grew up in this place mm -hmm. you know so Onondaga is slightly different than Oneida or Cayuga or Mohawk, right? So they're different languages, but mm. those languages enable them. And that's why when the when the when the boarding schools stripped language out of the children, they were essentially um, not only um, taking their identities away, they're also taking away an ability to engage the world around them, the natural world around them. So yeah. I think that's one way to think about how there are these ceremonial activities. And it's in a cycle of 13 different moons. So mm. each moon has a different Thanksgiving ceremony associated with it. So, and, and Onondaga carries that on quite a long So we're talking about calendars. That's what I was wanting yeah. to emphasize here. Um, you know, there is not a chart where you check off the days, right? The calendar time is kind of observed by the different flowers that bloom or the trees that, you know, mm. provide maple syrup. It's a whole other time frame. And it, it it all has to do with these relationships. Often when a certain flower, there are some flowers that'll bloom to announce when maybe a certain fish will spawn. Or, you know, it's all interrelational and it's a whole different way of mm. charting time. Mm. And it's much more interactive, mm. you know, because you'll be fishing and you need to know these things to chart when you need to do this to sustain your body. It's mm. not a calendar. It's very different. And the language has verbs in them embedded, these indigenous languages. They're usually interactional so when you lose that language and then you begin to just categorize fish or, you know, salmon or, you know, they don't have the same relationship when you categorize it and it's separate from how you share a life with that being. So it's it's very, very deep, you know, and this was all stripped from us. Yeah. And it's much more... Um, yeah. So, that, yeah, not to put too fine a point on it, really. Religion was used as a weapon against indigenous peoples right yeah. so so yeah. so so how do you talk about religion outside of that um outside of that real aggressive kind of perspective um you have to kind of back away think about how these values how we value the world differently the monetary system is a system of values right mm -hmm. it's a system mm -hmm. and that's one that we live in every day and so that creates a certain relationship to the world around us, right? Um, what we're talking about in a kind of indigenous value system is a gift economy, right? An exchange. And that's what a ceremony is, after all, right? It's a uh, gift yes. given and a, give, a gift received. So, so how uh, that, that becomes a different way of kind of existing in the world. Yeah. Um, monetary values are one sort of world of 
of exchanges. And then, so values is not just ethics and morals. It's also economics, essentially, you know. Mm. And science, as you say. <laughs> yeah, and science and valuation, right? You know, with yeah. world trade, though, you can't appreciate the cycles of these food sources that you're eating because yeah. you're getting them from the other side of the globe. Yeah. So you've yeah. lost that, you know, relationship yeah. where you live, the place where you inhabit. Yeah, and I think it goes to the, the, the bioregionalism that you were right. talking yeah. about, you know. Yeah. I mean, they wouldn't put it like that, but essentially... Uh, that's what we're talking about. Um, being being place-based. Yeah, yeah place-based, but also yeah. acknowledging the beings that reside there. So as a, there is a spiritual, if you like, a kind of spiritual element always, mm. this kind of mm. realism. Yeah. yeah, incredible. There's a question here um, about museums um, and, and I guess other institutions. That's great. It seems yeah. like a really important way of, yeah. of building accountability. Have you got any thoughts about that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lots. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah. There's a reason why we're a center and not a museum. Okay. And that is because you know, and you know this, being Australian as well, that that museums were essentially set up by anthropologists of the past. You know, just as religion was set up by missionaries of the past uh, to steal the you know the 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 cultures of of these indigenous peoples and put them in a museum because the thinking was that in the face of progress, these people were going to disappear. And so the Haudenosaunee, in several conversations that we had in the Longhouse, we, we were, we were uh, quite rightly instructed that this could not be called a museum. Mm. It would not have any backing from, from Haudenosaunee if it was a museum. It had to be a center and a living center. Yes. Not only are we talking about or values or heritage center, either. yeah, right. right. And so we're we're talking about the future in many ways, and it has yeah. to be, it has to be an active kind of space, and not just not just something that we're, you know, uh, what peering into the past or some imagined past. Mm. Now, um, the other thing is that, as I mentioned, we're coming to London to work in the National Archives. Mm. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, our collaborator there who came over for our Doctrine of Discovery right. conference in December, right. he was just really um, amazed by having this perspective on the texts and the documents and the objects that they have in the National Archive. Oh, and so yeah. we're going to be going over there to have a kind of meeting of the minds, you know, because, they, you know, there's so much stuff that is in the archives that yeah. are treaties. There are these original treaties uh, with the Haudenosaunee. And, and so it'll, and, and they're also working on their own 250th anniversary or exhibit of the American Revolution, I guess, from the British perspective. Um, but they want to have the Haudenosaunee perspective on that as well, and bring Which that is, into the that. National Archives. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. we're really excited about that, and, yeah. and I think I think I think everybody realizes that we need new a, a, a new ancient perspective. I don't know, um, you know, a, a different framework for thinking yes. about yes. about how we came to be where we are. Yeah. We're so excited to have taken an interest, you know, yeah. in yeah. the work here. Yeah. There is just so it's incredible much work to doing. do and so much information to get yeah. out. Yeah. And like I said, you know, we repurposed this center that yeah. had been feeding this propaganda about Christianizing the Onondaga up until 2015. Mm. We mm. have uh, regents exams in our public schools. The children are not learning yeah. this stuff. Yeah. And so, you know, things are changing, though. We're getting so much yeah. attention now with the center in a few years, nine years. Yeah. But there's um, still so much work to be done. Yeah. I've just so got another, we, another we little We invite list. you all. We invite you all yeah. to come over to Onondaga Nation. We'll give you a tour. We're coming. <laughs> I was, I was I just going it. to put another little Australian parallel there. There's a, um, the Gunditjmara people in southeastern Australia. They, they have um, a keeping place. So it's not a museum, it's not a center, it's a keeping place. And it's mm -hmm. very, and they're, and they're reclaiming many of their artifacts and, um, you know, important things. And they are in the, play, in the place and it's not open for all, all eyes to look at at any time. It's very much 
um, you know, a special place. And then alongside that, they have a centre. And that's, that's now a world, a United Nations World Heritage Site, the, the Gunditjmara area, because it's so extraordinary. So it's it's happening, isn't it, across the world, these these changes yes. in, in perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. yeah. Um, we have about five more minutes. Are there any more questions in the um, in the chat? Any anybody got any more thoughts? This question: How can we make museums uh, more accountable? Something that we're tossing to the um, historical association that controlled the narrative here is that um, we're we're kind of pressuring them that it's really time to have an exhibit to fess up and admit uh, that you'd been sharing mm. propaganda, mm. Um, these lies, these historical lies to our public, which mm. makes it so hard to educate people because they've learned these false narratives. But if mm. we don't get that from the other side, that yes, this was indeed done in our past, and we need to put it on the table and talk about this, mm. yeah. so we can come together and forge a new direction here that's more honest and more mm. beneficial to humanity in the natural world. Mm. Yeah. Truth telling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think I think um, I don't know anybody at the British Museum, but I know you have a lot of stuff. So, <laughs> um, so I and you know, um, just the little museum that that organizes the Scano Center. They had it was founded 150 years ago, not very long ago in your terms but it <laughs> but they had were holding a number of of skeletons um at, of the onondaga and that's really how they were founded so so um there's a whole movement to repatriate those remains mm. and rebury those ancestors uh ceremonially and um so uh there's been a lot of efforts in the united states to repatriate some of this um what's called cultural patrimony not the best word but but it's, it has it, it um it has a, a real revitalizing effect on indigenous peoples and i will end with this too i think it's very important to support indigenous peoples if and and their world views as a way forward to to reestablish proper relationships to the natural world right yeah. so yeah. So rekindling that now, in, you know, of course, in the United States, we still live in a colonial situation. Essentially, we're still a, a colony. So it's very different than in Europe, you know, or other places. But um, so, you know, establishing a relationship to the land would be a good start. Right. Mm -hmm. um, which is not the case in other places. But in a colonial situation, there's a lot to get to overcome in order to to find that way uh to the land i think mm -hmm. that makes it, sense. it does and and very very briefly impossible question how do we do that with eight billion of us on the earth and most of us living in cities yeah right that's always a question that Oren lyons asks Sorry to drop uh, that right on the door handle but <laughs> yeah yeah no Oren always asks he says so Oren is 94 years old and google mm -hmm. Oren lyons if you don't know who he is and you'll see yeah. a lot of and uh, Oren is a faith keeper here at Onondaga, and he's traveled the world on his own Haudenosaunee passport, uh, communicating the the values. Uh, of an, another really important book is a uh, basic call to consciousness, which recounts their trip to the United Nations in Geneva in 1977. Mm -hmm. And Oren, Oren um, always talks about, uh, still to this day, talks about um, when he was 20 years old, 1950, there were 2 billion people in the world. Yeah. Something like that. I'm not getting the numbers exactly right. Now there are four times that number of people, mm -hmm. you know, in just his lifetime, mm -hmm. which means that we have a real dilemma on our on our hands who how are we going to feed those people how are we going to house those people where is their water going to come from how do we instruct those people on mm -hmm. how to live in mm -hmm. balance with the world this is going to be a real problem 
not that I know what to do about it, but we're we're going to see a lot of misery. I mean, that's what I think Oren is telling us. Uh, we're in a time of prophecy right now, and and we're going to be seeing a lot of misery throughout the world. And I um, and we, I mean. I don't know. I think we have to keep to the message, though, somehow. Instruct people how to live in balance. If and we keep can. asking the questions and pressuring the people you that represent you. Right. It's got to come from the people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, I think you you are, you do have answers <laughs> or, you know, ways ways to go from back, back to this baseline of, of right relationship with the natural world. I think we have to find this, don't we, even in the cities? But, but the indigenous people in your territories that have that knowledge support them. Indeed. You know, because yeah. the better the connection is established with the natural world, the more you will learn from the natural world. Yeah. It's just setting something back in motions, um, mm. generative energy that we need to re-engage with. Mm. And then you'll begin to learn from your yeah. surroundings. Yeah. And and too often you see a kind of antagonism between the environmental movement and indigenous peoples, which I think really is unnecessary and really needs to, you know, has to change, you know. Um, so anyway. Well, many many in the environmental movement need to need to learn and change, I think, in relation yeah, to uh, yeah, that's yeah. Fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we're we're out of time. That was incredibly rich, incredibly inspiring. And and we are really, really grateful to both of you. Thank you so much. 